my master, the master blacksmith, told me once that when you're shaping a helmet or a breastplate or any other part of an armor, it uh, should look like uh, should look and feel like a lady, you know. All those curves and stuff. It was well, it's supposed to be like really pleasure to to watch, to watch and observe. And it's from visual visual point of view, it should have nice curves. So those uh, those curves I'm trying to to put into into knives today and make it make it look nice. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 106 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Thanks for joining us. The interview show, the weekend Sunday show, is where Bob gets a chance to talk to knife makers, knife designers, YouTube reviewers, makers, anyone who loves knives. If you are that person, then you know you are in the right place by joining us here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And Bob, a great interview coming up today from someone you've been uh, trying to lure in for a while, (laughs) a, a, a knife designer. Uh, yeah, uh, today I speak with Poland's Ostop Hell, and uh, Ostop comes up a lot in our supplemental show uh, when we talk about new knife drops, because uh, he's been burning up, he's been making a, a lot of uh, designs for Real Steel and other companies, and um, he has a line of kitchen knives coming out with Real Steel that we talk about. Great guy, and very interesting to uh, to talk to someone uh, across the pond, way across the pond, and and get a knife nuts perspective from over there. Great guy. All right. Before we get into that interview, I do want to remind you that if you would like to give us feedback or ask questions or provide topics for future shows, uh, give a call to the listener line at 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. We would love to hear from you. So without any further ado, let's get into that interview now. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? then you're probably a knife junkie. I'm here talking to Ostop Hell, uh, who is in Poland. Ostop, thank you so much for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Welcome. Uh, Hi, Bob. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, oh, it's my pleasure. So I've been, uh, I I first heard your name uh, on, I first read your name on the side of my Metamorph blade Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Real Steel Metamorph. uh, My first and favorite front flipper and uh, just a beautiful beautiful knife and uh i wanted to uh i wanted to talk to you and then and then since having that knife i've been seeing your name pop up uh because we on the knife chunky podcast we kind of cover new knife drops as they come out and your name keeps popping Mm -hmm. up and you've got this beautiful style and uh so tell me how did you how did you uh, get into knife designing i know you grew up in an art environment tell me about that uh, yeah, my father is uh, is an artist. So uh, when I was really young, like a few months, maybe a few years old, he was still uh, studying at uh, Academy of Art in Viv Ukraine. And uh, I was living with my parents there in a dormitory, in a student's dorm. And it was like full of artists all around. And I always liked to, to draw things and to sculpt and to, you know, make the artist activities and my father did it all the time, so I was kind of uh, inspired by him. And maybe it's it's just genes. I can't control it. <laughs> right, right. I, I, too, have those genes that uh, came down from my, my grandfather and through my mother. And I went to art school, too. I can't imagine growing up in art school, though. Man, that sounds, uh, that sounds yeah, like but, something. Uh, I was really young, so I don't remember many of, of the details, but still it was... Uh, I think it was the it was the beginning of of all of it. Very formative. And then, uh, so at some point, you moved on and uh, became a medieval armorer. Is that right? You uh, were making medieval. Yeah, yeah. It was it was like a beginning of of my workshop career. I always was uh, much into into knives, into knives, knights, and the medieval craftsmanship, weapons, armors, and stuff like that. And I've spent like uh, two years or, or a year as an apprenticeship in a local blacksmith or armor workshop when I was like a teenager. And it, it was uh, it was a cool experience. It's, it, I've learned a lot of basics and handworks. And it's, it's, it was the beginning of my workshop. <laughs> well, explain what you were doing in a medieval armor's workshop and how well, that translates <laughs> into what you do now. Uh, it was mostly an armor's. 
like a full plate armor and helmets and gauntlets and Whoa. all this uh, stuff when you, which you forge and form by hammers and by hand. And it was really hard to form and, you know, to control all those big pieces all around. But then after some time, I realized I'm making it only for fun because no one is wearing it today. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I decided to make a, a weapon then. It was like a kind of a medieval hammer. Then a little maybe a sword and then i realized that that swords are not an edc today you know no one everyday can sword. <laughs> yeah. so i i moved into yeah into um into knives first it was like a battle knives or uh armory knives uh, like bayonets from uh, kalashnikov from m16 i was uh, learning and searching about it and then from uh from uh, time to time i i've learned something new about those knives, not not only those, not only bayonets. And at some point, my friend uh, from the school, his father was a sailor, and he sails around the US, and uh, he brings uh, an SRK, called Steel SRK, oh, yes, a fixed the S- knife. And in early 2000s, uh, uh, we were at school then, and when I saw this knife and saw how beautifully he chopped the trees and stuff mm-hmm. like that, I was really in love and realized that I, that they want a professional knife, you know, because back yeah. then it was really expensive toy for a, for a teenager, like a professional military kind of, kind of tool. That's funny because uh, when I was a teenager, my first, uh, you know, I was always into knives as a little mm-hmm. kid, but the first one that really rang my bell and made me stand up to attention was also a cold steel. It wasn't the SRK. It was the mm-hmm. um, the original Tanto uh, mm-hmm. uh, back in back in the late 80s. I saw that thing and I was like, oh, wow, this changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a cold steel that did that for you, huh? Yeah, it was my first like a uh, high-end knife, not like a market knife or a cheap one, but the first, first professional tool I feel in hand and I worked with. And it was a really nice experience, you know not to bend the knife or not to broke the knife after a few chops or a few cuts because yeah. early back then it was like some uh, really cheap knives like uh, for a few bucks and you can't really work with them properly yeah the kind of stuff you pick up at the flea market that comes from yeah, pakistan exactly. and mm-hmm. has that smell to it <laughs> so when you're uh, it, so uh the medieval armor so you're not only making swords you're making um you're making armor plates and stuff like that. So you're yeah. you're actually hammering all all of those domed shapes uh, for the chest plates and all that. Exactly. It was mostly an armors, not weapons, because weapons was like kind of part of this this whole thing. But uh, mm-hmm. it was mostly an armors, like breastplates and helmets, as you said. Did did working around uh, that kind of stuff, but also uh, figuring out how to make it, figuring out how it's supposed to look. Did that affect your designs downstream? Like nowadays, do you think uh, your, uh, for instance, your kitchen knives, the new kitchen knives that are going to be coming out uh, with real steel. They're beautiful, by the way. Yeah, I love you. them. <laughs> they're, the, they're the first kitchen knives in years that I've been like, oh, maybe I could use a little update in the kitchen. I, I really love the way they look. But is there anything about your design process that is still influenced from that European medieval uh, weaponry? Uh, I think yes, because my master, the master blacksmith, told me once that when you're shaping a helmet or a breastplate or any other part of an armor, it uh, should look like uh, should look and feel like a lady. You know, mm-hmm. all those curves and stuff. It well, it's supposed to be like really pleasure to to watch, to watch and observe. And it's from visual visual point of view, it should have nice curves. So those uh, those curves, I'm trying to to put into into knives. Today and make it make it look nice, you know. Yeah. So you came up uh, uh, drawing things freehand, obviously, as a as a young artist. Do you still uh, tell me about your design process? Explain how you go about coming up with a knife and then getting it to market. Now, first, it's uh, an inspiration. It always starts from an inspiration, like you see a tulip uh, or uh, any other uh, different, like uh, part in uh, in your environment that you that inspires you. It could be a flower, it could be an animal, it could be a shape, it could be a doorknob. It was one inspiration was once a doorknob. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then you go to the uh, to your back. In my back, there is always a sketchbook and a pen. Uh-huh. So a quick quick sketch. Then when I'm back in home, I'm drawing the whole thing, redrawing it from the sketch I've made before. 
And then, of course, of course, 2D, the computer designing. And after 2D and checking if everything is work, I do the 3D. After that, I usually make a model and try to fill it in hand, if it's comfortable or not, and finding the hard spots and stuff like that. And after that, it's, it's basically ready. So when you're prototyping, you say you make a model. Do you uh, Are you a knife maker as well as designer? Do you have a shop and, and all of that? Uh, yeah, I have a shop. Uh, it's like since three years, maybe. Uh, I have my own shop and I'm collecting all the necessary stuff to become a real knife maker. I right. do things. Uh, I did a few knives also. Uh, fixed blades, mostly mm-hmm. one uh, folding knives. But I, I really want uh, my knives, my custom knives in the future looks like exactly like on my designs. And Without real uh, nice machinery, you can't you can't do it like that. So I'm still learning and still collecting stuff to my workshop just to maybe start making knives in a, in a year or two, maybe three when everything will be ready and set up so I can make a result I want. Well, how do you find the translation uh, process going from the sketch that you that you re- that you sketch down in your book, which is kind of a a free-flowing, spirited activity, making a drawing, and then going to uh, the more engineering side of things on the computer. What's that translation like? Uh, usually, I lose few few things during translations, uh, translations, but um, it's also getting more, uh, you know, more harmonic. Because when you draw a line on a paper, it's never a really straight line. When you draw a circle, it's never a straight circle. And after you translate it in computer, the whole thing becomes uh, really harmonic and with knives, geometrical shapes. I really like geometry in my knives. So every nice, every line meets a spot, a certain point, and each point is connected to the circle, and everything became ni- nice looking thing after right. driving it into computer. Right, right. So does the, you you were talking about inspiration, doorknob, tulip, whatever it is, do you see the inspiration running through the drawing and into the CAD? Does it still exist by the time you get to CAD? Uh, I am always trying to keep it as much as I can, but uh, it's, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. And when uh, something uh, became an inspiration, uh, sometimes it, uh, it happens to to work out, but sometimes it's it's getting lost in the process and I Usually, then I just change the name oh, of okay. the knife. Well, it takes on a new identity, kind of like... Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. So, it starts like a flower and ends like an animal, and then you name it completely opposite way and make right. a new knife. And only knew, I knew about it, so it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, what inspired the metamorph then? That, that, that's, that was my entry knife for you. What was the inspiration for that? Uh, the inspiration for that was uh, geometry. Like uh, straight lines, uh, shapes, simple straight shapes based on few circles, few arcs, and uh, and few lines. Uh, also, a uh, front flipper thing. It was, uh, I think, Boker Excalibur, the first front flipper I've ever seen. Yeah. It was really like a few years ago. And after the Boker Excalibur, I didn't see many front flippers on the market. Like maybe few of them, maybe not. And I decided to go into into the front flipper thing, and also because it matched the lines of the knife, because there is no point sticking out of the outline. You know, front yeah, flipper yeah. is in line with the with the whole thing. Yeah, it's an incredibly clean clean look. And then you came out with the with the second version of that. What what inspired the second version? Uh, the viewers. I watched a lot of YouTube videos mm-hmm. like uh, reviews of, of the metamorph uh, reading blogs and stuff and everyone want to say something in comment like this is comfortable this is not this was okay this was great this is not and uh, many people uh, said it was too slippery because of the plain aluminium handle mm-hmm. some of them uh, said i wish a deep carry pocket clip some of them said i wish a better steel and i collect those thoughts rethink it and we jo- we connect with real steel guys from real steel and uh, discuss all those things and decided to to make a better version for customers. That is so cool. That's exactly what we knife junkies, we knife collectors want. You know, we want to hear that that uh, knife makers, knife designers are listening, and it's it's really cool. And and not that we want you to bend to our every whim, <laughs> but it's it's great. You know, when you when you hear a preponderance of people saying eh, it's a little slippery, that that you're nimble enough to say, okay, let's let's change this. Yeah, let's make it better. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, I think that is one thing that, uh, social media and YouTube have really done for the knife industry and back and forth. And there's, there's less guessing on the part of the knife maker. They, you know, you can kind of, if you watch enough of these review videos, you can kind of tell what people like and what they're looking for. And, yeah, uh, exactly. you know, not that you have to change your self expression, which I want to, I want to get into at some point, uh, how this is a self expression, uh, for you. But I want to tell you a little bit about, my metamorph uh yeah, sure. <laughs> relationship <laughs> so i have the original and um actually i had the original i sold it to get the new one and then i never got the new one so i need to get the new one now but i might have to get both so i can compare and contrast because that's kind of how i am uh but i i came up with this really i i discovered that the metamorph is not only a great edc knife but it's also an excellent uh uh, reverse grip tactical knife and i look at kind of everything like weapons um and so i would uh i would sort of practice and be cool and and have the metamorph can hide really well in your hand like you're casually walking up and there it is and if you use the side of your forefinger you can make it flip out and suddenly you've got a knife in your hand so i was i was practicing being cool like that and uh not so cool i ended up stabbing my palm a co- of, like a bunch of times because mm-hmm. Because I was trying to hot dog it, you know, I wasn't doing it the way you're supposed to be opening it. Um, and, and that is a testament to how amazingly acute and sharp that tip, that whole, that blade is such a beautiful shape. And the tip is uh, amazingly acute. Yeah, that's that's always the, uh, also a thing I, I'm trying to implement in my design, the aggressive look. Because I think mm-hmm. the knife as a tool, it's, it's okay, but everyone knows has those feelings, especially men's, that when you grab something, you want to, you know, make it, make it look cool, as you said, make it look dangerous, make it look, uh, you know, uh, fear factor. They, they said they call it fear factor. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. uh, uh, the, the tips and, uh, uh, not only the tips, the whole overall look of the knife, in my opinion, should be very aggressive just to attract, attract uh, potential customers. Like, I think it's like with cars, like uh, sport mm-hmm. cars and, you know, modern looking cars like uh, Lexus, Lamborghini. They all have like sleek but kind of aggressive lines and designs. Yes, and this uh, the, uh, to me, the metamorph is James Bond aggressive. It's not, uh, mm-hmm. it's not uh, you know uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger commando aggressive. Yeah. It's it's like how can I how can I wield this like James Bond would? I mean that's <laughs> that's what I think when I think. Yeah, that's such a gentleman knife. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But but with a with an edge. <laughs> with an edge, exactly. So I also read that you went to law school. Uh, yeah, like I, it was a university. So five years, it's like a full degree and master thesis. And after five years, uh, I've, <laughs> I've ended up with that and decided to focus on things I really like. Well, I've always thought that uh, it, with a law degree, you can do anything. You know, you can go into any business, you can do anything. You have that great backup. Actually, yeah. It helps probably in setting up a business. Yeah, exactly. It helps in your business. It, it was kind of inspiration also for, uh, for stuff I do. Currently, because my master thesis was about uh, knives, knacks, and other dangerous tools in Polish law. So I okay. I've read about it and uh, wrote a master thesis about uh, about law and knives and how it's supposed to work and how it's working here in Poland and in other different countries, in the US also. So you said the laws governing knives and knucks, like uh, knuckle dusters? Yeah, exactly. They treat it like a vapor, weapon and you get usually go to the jail. Yeah. Or possessing it or using it or stuff like that. But I've, um, in my master thesis, I've uh, wrote, uh, wrote about uh, things, uh, but um, it's hard to talk about law, yeah. you know, in English. Well, uh, yeah, right. Well, <laughs> yeah. What's, what's the overall, what's the presiding um, attitude in Poland about knives and, and just kind of self defense and that kind of thing? Uh, actually, it's uh, about knives, it's really free, free to go. You can carry mm. every knife you can. Uh, uh, every every lock, every blade length, every type of mechanism. So it's kind of cool. The only thing you can't carry it's a, it's a blade or a sharp things object hide in a object which is not look like a weapon. So it's like a sword in umbrella, uh, uh, dagger yeah. in a belt knuckle, you know, and uh, stuff like that. Dagger in a boot, hidden yeah. hidden stuff. But right. if you make it visible, you can carry a sword, you can carry an axe, you can carry a knife. It's it's all legal here. Oh my gosh. All my listeners are going to move to Poland. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll go there first and I'll tell you if it's really that great. <laughs> yeah, but it's, in Europe, it's one of the less, uh, you know, you can't find many countries like Poland in Europe. 
In Czech Republic, they have like no almost no restrictions in Hungary too, but in uh, Western countries like in Germany, UK, France, there are restrictions and blade lengths and lock restrictions, so it's not cool. <laughs> So uh, what conclusion did you come to uh, in your master thesis about Polish knife law? Uh, Sounds I'm pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it was it was interesting. Uh, I wrote about knives and knacks, and, and the conclusion was uh, it was written, okay, in the right way, but it's all about the interpretation of the, of the law. What we can consider as a knife, where is the blade length? When you say it, uh, it's forbidden to have a knife, under two inch blade length, for mm. example. So wh when, wh where did you start to measuring this thing from the cutting edge, from the sail, from the tip in the straight line? And if you have car curvy blades, so it's like curve or a straight line, you know, yeah. things like that. Where are the, the, the points? And uh, uh, the conclusion was we have to think about, uh, about the laws and interpret it in the right way, you know, just not to make, um, a funny situation because my, in my master thesis, the funny situation was uh, actually a real one. As I mentioned before, you can't carry a knife, a knife or a blade which is hidden in uh, something which is not look like a weapon, right? Like an umbrella and stuff. And there was a case in Poland uh, with a guy who carried a fixed knife under his arm in a sheet, and he gets stopped by police and go to the to the court, and just said that uh, in his opinion. He was carrying a knife in a sheet, and sheet does not look like a weapon, so it's a hidden knife, you know. And it was like kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's absurd. Yeah, and we we have to avoid those absurds and you know punish only people who carry those hidden weapons, not in the sheets, but in a in a hidden stuff and trying to sneak it into jail, into airports, right. into stuff like that where knives are forbidden strictly. Well, you know, here we have uh, we have the fifty states, and each state has its own knife laws and they're all nuts in one way or another and there's a great group here called knife rights uh, mm -hmm. headed up by doug ritter and and uh and they're going state by state and lobbying legislators and getting getting the uh the laws changed state by state which is great but it, it really shines a light on how old our knife laws are they um they mention that you can't walk around with a bowie knife or a dirk <laughs> you know a naval yeah. a naval dirk or uh, you know, a, a ballistic knife like out of the 80s, mm -hmm, you know, the exactly. 80s movies and like things that no one carries and and but also restricts switchblades like like it's West Side Story or Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> so I think maybe what they do to avoid absurdity is maybe get an expert involved when they're writing the legislation. <laughs> maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> you know? Hey, does it sound goofy if we say uh, you can't carry a dirk? Uh, yeah, they haven't carried those in 150 years, man. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, there was funny urban legend here in Poland and in other Slavic countries about the knife restrictions mm -hmm. because you can't, you can't carry a blade which is longer than your... Uh, yeah, your palm. Same thing here. Yeah. You hear that everywhere it's, here, it's too. It's an urban legend, you know? Yeah. And wh why is so? And the smart people say, well, because if it's longer, it can reach your heart. <laughs> uh, not really, because if you're fat or skinny, it, it can or can't reach your, you know, yeah. if you have like a, you know, chest like Arnold Schwarzenegger, that even two, two palms won't reach your heart. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, man, I've seen some cops that have palms that are, you know, pretty giant. So I don't exactly. want to get, yeah. So it, it's. That so interpretation. It's a world, worldwide urban leg legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look at that. We've we've discovered it. So, how did you get to be? Um, des describe your process to become a full time knife maker. I mean, you've got medieval armor. You've got art school. You, I mean, you've got an art background. You're a lawyer or or have a law training. It's it's a very diverse uh, uh, background and training. How did you? decide that it was knife making and that you were going to go for it and set up a shop and, and become full-time? Uh, so when I was uh, in, uh, in law school, I was still collecting knives. Uh, I have like a SRK. I've bought an SRK finally from Cold Steel. I bought Hughes Spiders course, Benchmade a 710, my favorite model, and uh, Spiderco Tenacious. And after I carried some time at Tenacious as my ADC, I decided to to change it a little bit. And uh, back then I didn't have a shop, so I just changed it in my computer in a paint, the basic program, just brush some some stuff I didn't like and change shape here and there. And I show it on a local uh, forum, internet forum about knives. 
Uh, and uh, people said, well, it looks nice. Uh, someone said, this looks even better than original. And I was, I was like, well, nice. Okay, so maybe I will try to redesign the spider tenacious and I redesign it. And it was kind of okay. But, but during those process, I almost created a new knife and realized that it's easier to, to make a new one than redesign someone other's uh, idea, you know, just to fit your requirements. And after that, uh, some guys from forum said, uh, hey, Ostap, the Real Steel, the new company back then on the market, uh, looking for a collaboration. They have like announcement on their website. We are looking for new ideas, blah, blah, blah. And maybe you should try to, to go there. You know? And I was, okay, sure. I was, I've sent them the designs. I've sent them the alien neck, the neck knife with skeletonized okay. handle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they say, okay, let's do this. And after that, we make a few more knives. Like G3 Pukko, then uh, Kiritashi, uh, G5 Metamorph finally, like whole G series. It's from Gentleman. Oh, oh, okay, all right. So it's like G5. It's a it's a Gentleman number five, Gentleman number three. So the the idea was to design a modern, cool looking knife for for a everyday carry for a gentleman for James Bond, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and was uh, it's so uh, like with a G Sleep too. Now the new model Sleep Joint from Real Steel. Oh, oh yeah, yes. Sleep. Oh my god! I can't believe I forgot to mention that. That is gorgeous. We were talking about that on our uh, on our uh, Wednesday podcast mm-hmm. a couple of weeks back. I think that's when you got in touch with me, or maybe it was after we talked about your kitchen knives. But that the G slip is really cool. I, yeah, I think so. I, I I love the the um, modern interpretation of the um, you know of the gentleman's uh, of the slip joint. I love the real long pull to, uh, on the length of the blade and. It, it's yeah. beautiful. Pers- personally, I, I hate sleep joints. <laughs> Why? Yeah. You know, uh, one of our co-hosts uh, on the Thursday Night Knives show, uh, Zelric, who also designs knives with mm-hmm. Todd Knife and Tool, he hates them. And he's like, why would you use one when locking knives exist? Exactly. Yeah. But it was like uh, requirements. Make a sleep joint. Okay. I will try to make it my way because the worst the worst part in sleep joints for me uh-huh. are those when they are are open, they look okay, but in closed position, they are always latest out of the handle somehow because of the mm-hmm. type of the lock and the pivot rotating point. It's really lower under the, you know, under the lock. So in a, in a G slip, I over, overthinked it and make a, a two screws. When you unscrew the G slip, the main screw is right exactly in the middle. But when you see, when you, Take a look at it. You realize it won't fold if you put a rotating pole point exactly in the middle of the handle. It should be like way lower. So when you unscrew the main screw, there is a hidden screw in lower position. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's an aesthetic thing. That's yeah. like strictly. Ooh, I like it. Just to make it look, you know, in one line and in, exactly in the center. Yes, it's yes. really hard to make. It's it's impossible to make in slip joints to make a rotating point in the center. Right. Well, this is funny because this is a question I ask all the time. Uh, like, how how important are aesthetics in your design and it's in in any knife maker's design? And in yours, you know, obviously aesthetics matter a lot, but they don't impede uh, the utility at all. So to hear that you've uh, that that you did that on this knife just to make it just to make the design like coalesce perfectly, uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's. It sometimes it works. Some designs look uh, very nice when you don't try to fit them to, to the hands. Mm-hmm. Like uh, sometimes I, I dream about the designing a knife without all those requi- requirements for four finger grip or a sharpie point, which will you know uh, hurt your hand. You can make a knife with it, and for example, use it in a film or a video game where, when where it doesn't matter, you know, if right, it fits right. the hand right or not. So uh, tell me about the kitchen knives. How did that come about? Was this something uh, an idea you had or did they come to you? And describe your design process and what your inspirations were for that. Uh, actually, they was uh, made for an order for a uh, real steel. Mm-hmm. They, they wanted to make a kitchen knife and they asked me to design one. And the origin of those kitchen knives was a metamorph, to be honest. <laughs> when you see mm-hmm. the few lines, you match match the you know the whole thing together and you will see the the metamorph inside inside this handle it must be why it resonates with me but they also they also seem to have a, a bit of a japanese vibe to me yeah for like a santoku style blade because mm-hmm. one, that was one of requirements i've looked through santoku blades and uh, traditional japanese knives and also a modern uh, chef knives from europe from us 
and combined it with metamorph and create some some kind of I'm not a cook. I I don't really know how to cook well, but I use <laughs> knife in the kitchen from time to time, and right. you know, I'm trying to to do my best to to design it well. Well, I was going to ask. I know the uh, the larger the largest knife. It's there are three knives. There's a, a chef's mm-hmm. knife, uh, like a, a a boning knife or a utility knife, and then a small paring knife. Uh, but the the large chef's knife has a has a thicker than traditional stock. Yeah, what, what's that stock about? Is, stock is really thick because they ask about a tactical kitchen knife, <laughs> you know, and yes. it's kind. But it was it was hard to to match together because if it's tactical and kitchen the same knife, how do you, you know <laughs> how do you combine it? And the only way for me it was like to make it a little bit thicker than usual. So when you you know use it on a outdoor, I don't know if everyone anyone would use a kitchen knife on a camp or somewhere, but right if you can you know make it. Make it a little bit thicker to make it more tactical looking. <laughs> oh my god! Well, I mean, anyone who all you have to do is take a look at it, and uh, yeah, you all you have to do is build a Kydex sheath for that, and and it can be an all arounder. You can have that in the kitchen. I mean, sometimes I think, uh, and I am no expert chef at all, but sometimes I like a slightly thicker uh, kitchen blade, only because it. Sometimes I find, though maybe not as slicey, it'll separate the thing away from the knife and away from whatever I'm cutting. Uh, yeah, also, a little better and get it kind of out of the way so I can continue working. And for frozen stuff, like today I have like two frozen chickens oh, yeah. from my <laughs> fridge and try to, you know, pour them apart because uh-huh. they are thrown together. And this knife worked pretty pretty nice and I didn't <laughs> chip the tip or, or break the edge. It was kind of okay, like useful. Boom. So are those uh, are those knives out on the open market yet? Uh, I think they are uh, on the way to the dealers. Okay. To the To the shops. And maybe next time we will make it not a tactical knife, but a true kitchen knife, and make it as thin as possible for a cutting lovers, not for a outdoor carry man. Yeah, but well, the uh, but I did notice the boning knife and the paring knife are quite thin, so it was yeah, maybe it, it's, it, yeah. So I mean, you know, yeah, I think you get everything out of that set. Uh, in your knife making and knife designing, have you had any mentors along the way? Anyone who's shown you tricks? Tricks of the trade. Uh, tricks of designing. Yeah, my father. <laughs> Your father. Yeah, it's always go through through his through his uh, eyes when I design something. I always send to him or show to him, and ask of his opinions. Also, a few fellow makers from uh, from Poland, uh, really nice guys. Uh, I've asked about opinions and stuff, and they have also nice ideas and inspirations from uh, from other na- other makers makers all around the world because it's still growing up and now it's it's growing up really fast after you know the few breakthroughs we have few designing breakthroughs like uh, Isham Isham Blade Works we yeah. Life as Hatton yeah. it was it was a breakthrough in in the designing way it it showed it showed that uh, manufacturers can do almost impossible you know things with crazy grinds and crazy shapes Right. And it's 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 really inspirational, what yeah. Like it, that, the, the new break breakout knives. So uh, it, it it showed the world that a that that company can produce whatever they kind of want, and yeah. b they can they were also showing designers bring us your craziest stuff because we can we can exactly. build it. Because we uh, when you design things there are always uh, restrictions like uh, manufacturing restrictions. For example, you can't uh, design a hole. With exactly sharp angles, because it's usual it's milled by an end mill, and end mill has a certain radius, so it always has to be a radius inside the pocket. You can design straight square pocket anywhere, right. you know. So you have to to think how to make it right, how to make it production possible. Uh, sometimes you have to think how to make it, how to fit in a, in a price range, because when mm-hmm. you're designing fifty bucks a knife. It should be simpler, you know, to, to make it and fit in those 50 bucks. When you don't have no limits, you can design crazy stuff with really tiny holes and a lot of uh, hand sanding, hand finish, finishing and crazy, crazy shapes. So when you send Real Steel a design, do you stipulate the materials? That I want this to be N- N690 blade steel and aluminum? or It's not like I want this to be, but uh, it's like uh, I really like it to be. This mm-hmm. way, you know, I got you. It's not, so it's not. I can't. I can't do nothing to you know to 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 say you must do it that way. You they usually pick a steel they have in a, in the factory. They have like their own design, uh, own designers, own engineers, which are also discussing all my designs. 
Mm-hmm. And I can make suggestions. Usually the companies I work with, the real steel, the best tech that we are willing to do in, in my way. But sometimes it's like between, uh, choose, uh, choice between M390 and uh, S30V. Uh, S30V. So it's, but both are the good steels. And for me, it doesn't really matter if it would be from this premium steel or other premium steel, you know? Right, right. Just, just do the knife right. Just honor it one way or another. He treat it right because it's, it's the, the way we, it should be done. And if it's a good premium steel, it's, it would would work. So you, you, you go to your father for critique and, and among artists, you know, you have to be able to take critique and, and be able to take criticism and, 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 uh, be able to grow from it. Uh, but how does that work with the companies you work with? We Real Steel, et cetera. Do they, when you send them a design, do they come back to you and say, uh, you know, take a little bit off the tail end or this? I mean, do they have a lot to do with how the design evolves or do you send it to them? They put it in their machines and it comes out. Uh, at the beginning, it was like a lot of change. They have to put the design, uh, almost well, not a lot of stuff. But after a few years, you, you learn how the companies works, how the big manufacturers are working with uh, what are the requirements, the technical requirements for uh, mass production stuff. And you, you're you trying to fit uh, your designs into a certain uh, manufacturer style. And uh, today, usually it's like a few minor, uh, minor changes, like a screw a little bit here, a little bit there, like a sh- sharpie point here and there, but nothing really which affects a main overall shape. So have you collaborated with, um, you've, you've worked with some of the greatest manufacturers. Have you worked with individual uh, knife makers, say in Poland or anywhere else uh, on small yeah, yeah. collaborations? Yeah, I've worked at the beginning when I uh, my, wasn't really popular back then and uh, i've designing stuff just for fun and from time to time local makers ask me to may i do this design sure i just draw it just make it but uh, after that i realized that when you design something and it looks nice and not everyone have the abilities to make it look nice you know in their shops so you see the knife and said well it's my design but i didn't design it that way you know yeah. So after a few of those tries, some makers did a great job. Yeah, it was like one to one exactly, or even better than my design because you know the whole uh, 3D and the real touch of the maker make the right. magic. But uh, I decided to go into the bigger manufacturers because they have uh, repeatability and quality. I really like in, in my designs. If I design it that way, they usually do it that way, and they can reproduce it that way exactly. again and again. again. It's hard to do that by hand. Exactly. So they can do to make it to the same metamorphs and both would be would look great and with exact exactly same quality. So do you have a uh, a peer group of knife makers uh, in Poland? Do you have a a lot of others doing this? Uh, yeah, we have like a, I don't know, maybe hundred makers. Wow. Okay. In Poland, few of them are quite quite popular. Uh, we have like a small group of of makers which. Friends mostly. We we are meeting a few times a year on a barbecue, ah. grabbing a few beers and discussing. Well, we said uh, to our wives that we are discussing knife knives and knife design, but it's not true. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we are just making barbecue and <laughs> yeah, drinking beer. <laughs> and drinking beer, yeah. And after and it's kind of a business trip, so we, we have to go there for a few days. You know, usually in summer. Right, um, right. <laughs> so how how is the knife business? Uh, do do you think it's a uh... Do you think it's somewhere you want to stay? Is this a, uh, or, or are you a designer and you could kind of design anything? Is, is it knives, period? I think it's, uh, it's not only, only knives because I, I try to design different stuffs like uh, everyday carry tools, but the knives makes me, you know, make it the most fun of it. I'm making the most fun of, of the knives. And I think I want to stay into, into knives and make it, make myself better and better and, and work with with the blades in you know, a folding knives and fixed knives and in a knife related stuff. You know? Right. So you said uh, EDC tools. Are you talking about like pry bars and knucks and that kind of thing? Yeah, pry bars, knucks. I'm actually made making a, a custom knucks by myself. You know, in my in my own workshop and this my my workshop business now. Beside that, I'm designing knives. Mm-hmm. But it's it's fun too because there are there are not so many restrictions as in a, in the knives. You know. Yeah, and you have to discover a whole new, whole new world about of of knucks, of everyday carry tools, of how they look, and they really sometimes uh, really match with the knives, like in everyday carry set. You now you have a similar center certain knife, 
certain NAC, a pry bar and a keychain and worry coin, a spinner and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's much all together in a, in an everyday carry set. Yeah. And you have to design it right. <laughs> yeah. And it all has to, it all has to be together. It all has to match yeah, together. You have to, you have to, you know, recognize the, the designer at least. It would be so nice to make, you know, a set of certain, uh, item, items like a knife, a spinner and something and see it all together in someone's pocket or purse. So, so what do you carry? What, what knife is in your pocket right now? Uh, it's a metamorph. <laughs> <laughs> cool. The the new version or the, no, or the, the first the old version? One. The first version. I, yeah. OG. I just it. Yeah, I have a way of opening it with my front finger. Mm-hmm. So it's not slippery at all for, for me. And I, I used to it. I never found that slippery. I just found the blade pokey until I figured out how to, how to, how to <laughs> get, get my dumb fingers to work. <laughs> Thank so, uh, Ostop, where do you see Ostop Held Designs in 20 years? Where where are you going to be? Uh, I th- I hope I will have my uh, bigger shop with the uh, ab- abilities to make custom knives, custom folding knives, custom fixed knife, mm-hmm. and uh, working with with other other makers and other companies, mostly companies, I think, as I said, because of the reputability and quality. And now I'm working with uh, uh, Chinese companies, mostly or Almost, uh, uh, with like Bestech, We, Real Steel, and others, which you will see in the in the nearest future. Mm-hmm. But they are all Chinese, so uh, I think I w- it would be nice to you know to work with someone from Europe or in from US even, mm-hmm. just to just to try a new a new style and way of working because working with Chinese people is uh, it's really nice experience for me it was really nice and and completely new experience because it's completely different than talking with uh, people from Europe and making business with people from Europe or people from US they have a certain culture of, of work and stuff like that and i would really try want to try a, a different taste of this you know of this feeling from US or from Europe yeah because Design knife is only like a, a part of of my job, and I really like to those process of uh, discussing about design, you know, uh, exchanging ideas and and adjusting it to manufacturing possibilities and, and stuff like that. You know, the design is the only part of of the whole process, and this process usually involves a lot of people meeting new people, like yeah, like you even, you know, like uh, interviews or. Uh, discussing with um, members of uh, factories of uh, new brands it's it's a nice experience for me and i can train my english skill which is <laughs> really <laughs> your english I, I was gonna say let's do this in polish but your english was a little better than my polish so i decided yeah to a little bit <laughs> <laughs> uh, i would love to see your uh designs uh which just kind of naturally resonate with me across a, a broad spectrum of i'd love to see a zt uh, made by Ostop, designed by Ostop Hell. I think zero tolerance, <laughs> and you would make a cool knife together. But yeah, it would be would be nice if, if they would reach me. Yeah, I'm yeah, happy to, to go with it. <laughs> well, it's it's nice to hear that you you uh, you look to spread it far and wide. Uh, I, I think your your designs are awesome, and I I love how your name keeps popping up in yeah, knife news you. and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Yeah, because every company has its certain style. I'm always trying to to fit to the company style, you know, the because you have your own style. Like in my mind, I'm trying to keep it in geometrical look and way. But every company has uh, has a little bit of details which uh, you have to uh, keep in mind when designing knives for uh, for each company for each brand. You know, they have like certain style each of them, and you have to fit fit uh, to to their styles too. Like combine your style with their style and create a product which will look like, for example, real steel. But also people will say it's designed by Ostop. And in the same way with other company, it's like we way we way of making we knives, uh-huh. but it's designed for, by Ostop. So you know it's like combining two two types of designs, two types of styles right. of a company style and a designer style. All right. Well, uh, before we wrap, I just want to ask you what would you tell? Um, what kind of advice would you give young or not even young, but people who want to go into uh, knife making and knife designing and want to make it part of their career or their career. What Do you have any advice? Uh, yeah, for a knife designing, because I've not made many knives <laughs> yet. Mm-hmm. So for mostly for design parts, you have to keep drawing things, knives, sketches all around. I personally draw like uh, 30, 50 knives, concept of knives per day. You know, sometimes it's three hours of, of drawing and I can draw 30, 50 knives. And most of them are not very good, but one, two, three, sometimes four, 
they are kind of uh, a basic which I can move forward and work on them. So the advice is keep practicing and drawing things by hand or by computer if you like it that way, but, you know, make it many of them and every day. Like in with every class, with, with your body training, with your right. brain training, it's the same with your hand and imagination. Well, there you have it. Words to live by. Ostop, thank you so much for coming on (laughs) the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure to meet and talk to you, sir. Thank you, though. All right. You stay safe and take care. Stay safe. Take care. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Back on episode number 106 of the Knife Junkie podcast, Jim Person here along with Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Great interview there with uh, Bob with uh, Ostop. Interestingly enough, he had had, as we heard, a baby the day before you recorded this interview. Yeah, unbelievable. His first child, a son, was born uh, the day right before we spoke. And uh, he just sort of casually dropped that like, right. right as we were signing off. And uh, I was amazed that he was so composed. And, uh, well, of course, with uh, with the stay-at-home orders and such, uh, he, right. hasn't see- he hadn't seen the child yet. Uh, uh, he won't see the baby until until the baby's brought home. But I just thought it was uh, incredibly interesting. I'd be losing it because I've had two children, and that's what happens when I have them. I lose it. And he was just cool as a cucumber. Best wishes and best of luck to Ostop and his family uh, as they grow. Uh, One thing about him that uh, really left, uh, really resonated with me is aspirational, and that is he's a true Renaissance man. You know, he he uh, cut his teeth as a medieval armorer. So, I mean, he knows how to move steel around, shape steel, and and design things uh, for ergonomics. Uh, but then he also went to law school, and now he's a full-time knife designer uh, and and uh, and is getting the machines, uh, slowly acquiring the machines to start prototyping himself. And uh, uh, I just think that's great. I, I, I think to be great at one thing, it it helps to be uh, well-rounded in other categories. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean you have to be a master at everything. Right. Uh, uh, but but all of those other things, the medieval armory, the, the knowledge of law, and just the discipline it takes to study and get through that must help uh, in, in rounding you out as a designer. And right. incidentally, I see that in his, uh, you kind of see it running through all of his designs. His designs have a, a language all, all his own. I'm starting to see, uh, when something comes out, I'm like, hmm, I bet that's like that new slip joint. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now. It slips my mind, but the, the new slip joint he, he just came out with, uh, through real steel. I knew immediately, uh, it was his design. Mm. So interesting. Yeah. Start, start seeing it over and over after – well, not over and over, but you start recognizing it, like you said, over time, the yeah, little and, nuances. Right, exactly. They start, to, they start to build up and become identifiable. Also, another thing in, in speaking with Ostop, there is a thriving Polish knife scene. And he mentioned Trollski, who's a, a knife maker I've been following a long time on IG that I've seen on uh, Forged in Fire and, uh, and some other uh, big uh, – Polish makers over there. Uh, it's a growing community. I think maybe we have to get some of our friends who collect custom foreign knives to uh, to start looking into it. All right, folks, that is going to do it for the weekend edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. But do want to thank you for listening to this interview show and remind you that uh, Bob comes back on Wednesdays with the supplemental where he gets to uh, dive deep and uh, talk about some of the uh, I don't know, knives in his collection, knife news, those kind of things, and uh, several things coming up in the state of the collection this Wednesday that uh, Bob is going to talk about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll just leave it at that. That's right. We won't spoil <laughs> We won't spoil it too much. But that's coming up on Wednesday. And then, of course, Thursday, it's Bob's live YouTube channel, uh, live YouTube show on YouTube, the live uh, video show Thursday Night Knives. And that's at 10 p.m. on Eastern on Thursday night. Yeah. Well, we we found, Jim, in recording our regular podcast with the interviews, that there were still other things that we slash I wanted to talk about knife-wise, but who wants to hear me banter before you have a no-stop hell interview coming up? You just want to get to the interview. So we broke it out into these other shows so uh, so you can get those knife drops and those other things, but not have them in the way of getting to a killer interview. Yeah. So if you want uh, more information on any of those opportunities or uh, links to the Knife Junkies Facebook or Instagram or any of that good stuff, just visit thenifejunkie.com, thenifejunkie.com. You'll find links to everything and all the shows, podcast, everything right there. 
So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. want to thank you for listening to episode number 106 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.